Uh, I'm Peter Singer. I direct the Center for 21st Century Security Intelligence at Brookings, and delighted to welcome you all to this session and appreciate you coming out. Uh, exactly a year ago, few outside his, his friends, his family, his coworkers, and an extremely small circle of reporters had ever even heard of Edward Snowden, who was then a contractor with the NSA who had just informed his bosses that he was taking leave. Um, electronic data surveillance was certainly known of, but it couldn't be described as a central topic in either global political or media discourse. And then a series of articles came out based on intelligence leaks provided by Mr. Snowden, and it touched off what can only be described as a worldwide controversy and conversation. And you can measure this in all sorts of different ways. You can measure it by the 26 million news articles and blogs and the like that mention Mr. Snowden over the last year, to media prizes, to a new Oliver Stone movie in the making. Um, but what interests us most, I think, gather around here today is how in the world of policy, it was certainly one of the most, if not the most important event of the last 12 months. Just on the foreign policy side, it raised new issues in areas that touched on national security, bilateral, multilateral relationships, business competitiveness, trade agreements, global order, internet governance, and beyond. And so today, what we'd like to do is not rehash, but weigh. That is, this series of panels are not going to be about whether Mr. Snowden was in the right or the wrong, or whether the programs that he leaked about were good or bad. That debate has happened, and that debate will continue. But what we'd like to do is weigh the implications of it. What have they meant? What's been their effect? And so we've divided this conversation into two parts, which you, you can think of as a split between the regional side and the functional side. The first panel that's um, up here on stage with me will assess the regional reactions to the NSA revelations and what repercussions they had for American diplomacy, soft power, trust, and how they played out in a series of regions. And the second panel discussion will focus on the issue area side how they influence things like internet governance, trade, the intelligence community, and what those consequences mean for the future international order. And so um, my job as moderator now is to introduce folks and frankly get out of the way, because uh, we've got a great panel here. Um, first, we're going to hear from uh, Harold Trinconis, who's Senior Fellow in Foreign Policy at Brookings and Director of our Latin America Initiative. Linked to this topic, his current research focuses on Brazil's emergence as a major power and a specific investigation into that country's creation of a national internet and the implications for things like net neutrality, data protection, surveillance, and commerce. Then we'll hear from Tanvi Madan, who's a fellow in foreign policy at Brookings and director of our India project. Her work explores Indian foreign policy with a particular focus on the intersection of security and energy policy, especially with the US and also China. That leads to um, a person we'll hear from next, which is uh, James Lewis. Jim's the director and senior fellow with Strategic Technologies okay. Program at CSIS. We're a little bit out of order, but I'll, that's the order I'm going to jump to. Um, and his research examines international security and governance in cyberspace and the effect of the internet on politics. And of note to the topic today, he's led a long-running track two dialogue on cybersecurity with Chinese counterparts. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Carl Theodor uh, Zugutenberg. Um, Baron Zugutenberg is a distinguished statesman with CSAS, and he served in a wide variety of roles in German politics and European politics, including as German Federal Minister of Defense from 2009 to 2011. With CSIS, he leads a high-level transatlantic dialogue that's focused on a number of these issues in global trends, political, financial, and technology issues. And so the way um, the panel is going to flow is essentially I'm going to toss uh, the same question to everyone. Uh, the first one is, what's played out in the last year in your particular region that you've been looking at? What have been the effects of this? What's been the most important aspect, impact of Mr. Snowden and the NSA leaks debate. So why don't we begin with Harold? Great. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, for the, the introduction and for organizing this, this fantastic event. Um, 
Uh, I think when I think, when I look at the last year in Latin America, uh, obviously there was a great deal of interest in this story, uh, but for most of the region, with the exception of one extremely important country, I think the reaction was quickly muted. The countries that have worked with us closely on issues of security, such as uh, the Colombians or, or Mexico, for example, um, pretty much reacted uh, with some concern, but uh, muted concern, very parallel to some of the reactions from our other partners and allies. Uh, countries that have been more critical of the United States, uh, particularly the Bolivarian bloc, were also, interestingly enough, relatively muted because they kind of assumed this was going on all the time, you know, the whole time, so they weren't really particularly surprised. Um, but in the one case where it really made a, a major difference was in our relationship with Brazil. Uh, and I think this is particularly important because the U.S. and Brazil have been engaged previous to these revelations in an intense process for, for many years, uh, uh, especially during the Obama and Rousseff administrations, in intensifying relationships across a series of important domains, trade, economics, education, um, uh, uh, and, and uh, international uh, uh, security and, and global issues. Um, and the Brazilian reaction to the revelations, especially uh, President Rousseff's reaction to the revelations, was uh, extremely critical, uh, and it essentially led to the, a, a certain amount of paralysis taking hold in the U.S.-Brazilian relationship, uh, both at the senior level. Uh, she, uh, she postponed an official state visit to the United States that was scheduled to take place last October. Um, uh, at the government-to-government -government level, uh, bilateral working groups, forums, uh, slowed down or, or again, were, were, were paralyzed. Uh, there hasn't been much, much, much progress there. Um, and President Rousseff also announced a set of measures, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, that were designed or interpreted as asserting a more Brazilian internet, um, increasing domestic uh, uh, production of bandwidth, increasing domestic production of servers and equipment uh, uh, for, for the, the internet in Brazil, uh, increasing connectivity to, to other parts of the world that sort of routed around the United States. Um, uh, and this was sort of viewed as, as as part of uh, Brazil trying to build some sort of uh, effort to, to work around the United States on issues related to uh, surveillance and uh, um, uh, the, the global internet. Um, so that initial reaction even led to uh, her, the President Rousseff using the UN General Assembly speech in October to denounce the United States uh, and working with Germany on international digital privacy. Uh, more recently, though, I think we've seen a, a shift in Brazil's position, both um, a, 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 an interest in getting past uh, this issue in relations with the United States, maybe looking forward to next year, um, and also a very important global internet governance conference that took place in Rio de Janeiro, Net Mundial, in April, which showcased some very interesting uh, shifts in Brazil's position in global internet governance. Uh, which is a related issue uh, uh, that's uh, emerged as a result of the, the Snowden revelations uh, that I think portend for, for some very interesting uh, uh, Brazilian positions going forward. Cool. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, I, would, I would say the Indian reaction was twofold. There was the official Indian reaction that was relatively muted, enough so that you even had articles entitled Why is, India's taking, uh, Why is India Taking the U.S.'s Side in the Snowden Scandal? Uh, the foreign minister was, the Indian foreign minister a year ago, was seen as uh, almost defending or justifying um, NSA surveillance. Uh, and he, he said, and to quote, uh, they were able to use it to prevent serious terrorist attacks in several countries. And for a country that has faced several terrorist attacks uh, itself, uh, this was seen as him proving uh, of the surveillance. Uh, you had other kind of serving officials privately and former officials saying, uh, this is standard practice for government. This is just something governments do. Uh, others pointed out, including the foreign minister publicly himself, that India had similar systems in place, uh, and we all do these things. Uh, you, there was also a sense that the kind of official muted reaction at the, at the beginning of uh, the Snowden uh, scandal breaking uh, was uh, that the official muted reaction was partly because uh, the relationship was uh, at a relatively decent footing, and we've seen this in terms of how the reaction in India has played out, is when the relationship is considered to be more positive, uh, the, the reaction's been muted, and that the Indian government didn't want to come out and say something very publicly uh, it, that was negative that would affect the broader relationship. What we have seen over, over the course of the year 
that both the official and public reaction has changed somewhat um, in terms of how much criticism there has been, uh, partly as relationships, at least the public facet of it and some official facet of it has uh, deteriorated somewhat, though I would say it's turned around uh, again, and this was largely due to the, um, the, uh, uh, the arrest of an Indian diplomat, uh, which did create some problems in the relationship. And at that time, there was a lot of questioning, both within and outside government, of whether the Indian uh, uh, government should have taken a stronger stance and a public stance, uh, more akin to the Brazilian stance, which was praised by many in the Indian commentariat. Um, and I would say that the Indian public reaction, and kind of uh, in terms of uh, the media, uh, the uh, public opinion, but also analysts uh, and pundits uh, have had two kind of sorts of reactions. You've had one kind of uh, reaction that's been uh, one of indifference, uh, just assuming that all governments do these things uh, and that um, Snowden, there was very little love lost for Snowden himself, but that this is just something governments do, including the Indian government. There was also a sense that the debate about security uh, versus civil liberties uh, in India is very different, uh, that the Indian public is willing to let its government and would understand other governments uh, uh, having, uh, uh, emphasizing security over civil liberties. And so that was one reason why there was, or, or a couple of reasons why there was some indifference um, to these revelations. I'd say this, the, there was criticism, though, from certain segments, and there were two, uh, two types of criticism. One you found from people who tend to be critics of the U.S. in general. They saw this as vindication of their stance that the U.S. was either anti-India or didn't really think India was a friend, uh, and basically uh, treated other countries uh, badly anyway. So this was just more proof of that. But you did see people who do, did think who were supporters of the U.S., uh, who held it to, a, uh, to, to kind of higher expectations, who did come out and criticize the U.S. for saying, and the U.S. government saying, uh, that the U.S. had lost its moral high ground uh, and that this had damaged the U.S.'s moral standing. And not just the Snowden revelations themselves, what was surprising to them uh, was uh, the domestic, what they saw as the relatively muted domestic reaction in the US, which they also found disappointed. And I'd have to say for this group of critics, there was also a sense that it wasn't just the Snowden revelations, it was the debate uh, or the lack of debate about drone attacks, uh, torture and detention policy that they all put uh, in kind of a, a box together in terms of the reaction. You want me to go? Oh, sure, yeah. okay. We're gonna end on Europe. Okay, that's good. Um, and I'll do a good lead in there. So I think the, um, <clears throat> non-surprisingly, reaction in um, Asia, at least on the official side, has been um, not particularly dramatic. Uh, having talked to um, five of the countries in the region, they aren't, the governments, they aren't particularly upset. Japanese, the Koreans aren't particularly upset. The Chinese always knew we were doing this, so Snowden wasn't a big surprise. I mean, one advantage of being paranoid is occasionally you're right. So um, the, thing, the thing that was a surprise to them was they kind of believed a little bit some of the rhetoric you hear sometimes about, well, the, the US uh, sword has been blunted in these cyber talks. And so coming out of the blue and being smacked in the side of the head with indictments, why they were surprised, I don't really know, because they had been warned repeatedly including at the presidential level, that something bad was going to happen. So when I look at this um, in China and in Russia, um, they're eager to exploit Snowden uh, for advantage, political advantage, in their efforts in internet governance and cybersecurity. Um, they're eager to use it to undermine the US position, but their fundamental, uh, they weren't surprised and their fundamental positions haven't changed. Um, one of the things that's interesting, though, is that when you talk to people about progress in uh, cybersecurity. I think after the initial shock, the debate, at least in official circles, has become a little more mature. One of the things that's come up is there's a strong, and, and you'll hear more about this in a minute from uh, KZ, but strong reaction on the European left. I mean, they, they've been mourning the demise of Marxism now for, for more than a decade, and here's a way to be anti-American again and feel good about it. And that has a political effect, but not as much as you might think. And so countries are now saying, how do we rebuild uh, some effort to come to a common understanding on 
internet governance and the importance of democracy and human rights? How do we uh, rebuild understanding on how we make progress on cybersecurity? So I think that the effect of Snowden, I don't worry so much about the effect of Snowden on cybersecurity discussions. The things that are having the greatest effect are uh, Crimea, right, which has had a major effect, and the indictments. Um, and today's events, I think, the, uh, the Hegel speech at the Shangri-La conference and the um, uh, recognition of Tiananmen Square. The Chinese tend to put everything together, and so you can have talks with them, right? This is America, we don't have strategy and we're disorganized. They don't believe it, they think we're the Borg, right? Prepare to be assimilated. So they'll see this all as a plot. Aha, you know, um, indictments, uh, Hegel speech, uh, Tiananmen Square commemoration. It's part of your larger plot to control China. But Snowden really isn't a major element in that story. So. Um, I think the issue for, for Snowden and his handlers will be how does he remain relevant as the international discussion moves on. on. Thank you. Europe. Thank you, Peter, for having me here. The European reaction, first of all, there's certainly no coherent European reaction, which uh, probably doesn't come by surprise uh, in many other topics as well. But um, there was a different set of reactions during the course of the month after the revelations. I'd say the first one was almost a no reaction, specifically in Germany. It's, uh, the German chancellor and the German government was in a campaign mood at that very time, and she tried to keep it as low key as anyhow possible during the first couple of months. And counting on the abstract topic as such for many people in Germany, and that played out rather well up until the moment uh, the wire that, that uh, it was found out that her phone was wiretapped. And then we had a remarkable reaction in Germany, as you have all followed at that very time. And that brought us to a second level of reaction, which first of all was hypocrisy. So everyone was astounded and, 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 and showed outrage of how such a thing could happen without really pointing at that we all do it, and that the German government uh, certainly did not do it as sophisticated as, as it has been done over here. But uh, that was also kept at, the, at a level where it didn't really fit into the overall scheme. From there, the next reaction was a rather significant surge or resurge of a, I'd say, selective anti-Americanism, also, also again, specifically in Germany. And I would not only tie that to the left spectrum in Germany, it also was more or less covered by, a, um, by quite a remarkable group of uh, conservatives as well. So that was an interesting new development which uh, played into the overall, overall scheme as such. Third reaction were some panic reactions coming from uh, certain governments, but also from the EU, as such to say, what do we do now? Is there is there anything we could set against that very uh, revelations we have seen so far? And uh, one of those reactions was to immediately think about a European cloud, a debate which isn't over yet, as we know. Another one, and we may talk about how much sense that makes or not. Uh, another one was uh, tying with Brazil, uh, with the fantastic idea of an underwater uh, line to Brazil, and uh, also a very interesting coalition, by the way. Um, a, third, a third point that, that popped up was to take some of the agreements between Europe and the United States hostage, although they're just indirectly tied to the questions we've been discussing at that time. So TTIP will be, will be part of, of, the second, of the second panel here. But uh, we all followed uh, quite interesting discussions at that time as well, whether TTIP should be suspended or whether TTIP is uh, still relevant. And if you ask the people on the street, specifically in Germany, what they connect with TTIP, most of the time you get an answer that it is actually connected to all the big data discussion we are in right now. So the main topics of what TTIP is all about have been shifted into the background in, 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 that, in, in, in that very respect. The same is true for, for the, uh, the suspension of, of safe harbor agreement and so on. So you, could, you have seen a couple of these developments, specifically also coming out of the European Parliament, and the situation does not become easier after the recent elections we have had in Europe 
because the uh, stronger nationalist parties will definitely play that tune again and again and again and again. And there is a certain, there is a certain tendency and also temptation amongst um, the center spectrum of the parties to at least come a bit, to, to at least come a bit closer to some of the arguments we, um, uh, we have heard. All in all, the mistrust is still high. Unfortunately, also on the top level, the rather banal example of the communication strategy last year from over here towards, for instance, the chancellery uh, is, 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 just, is just one point to underline here. So typically, after, directly after the revelations and after it became clear to the President of the United States that Angela Merkel's phone was tapped, you would have picked up the phone and just call her. And that was in August last year, the latest. So that didn't happen. Then they waited up until the press revealed the whole thing. And even then, the president didn't call. It was the chancellor that called the president. And that's something interesting for, let's say, the general mood between heads of state. And not, there was not only a discussion in Germany and other parts of Europe whether the White House is entirely detached from former allies and, 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 or from allies and other partners, but also whether there's still a level of communication that could, that could bridge the problems we are facing in these days and at that time. And a last point, which is also, I think, rather interesting is, and that's also a reaction, and this is actually overtaxing or overstretching the own abilities from a European perspective. It came quite by surprise that the German chancellor, for instance, who usually never really steps forward with a rather radical uh, proposal. And um, some people say she follows more or less uh, the, um, the, the policy of keeping all options open, but to do it decisively to a certain extent. But she stepped forward and she said, well, we would love to have, or not only we would love to have, I will try to form a no-spy agreement with the United States. And even the question was in the room to join the Five Eyes Alliance. And for those who know actually the transatlantic relations at this time and, and, and for, the, for the last decades, it was rather clear that this is an illusion, it won't ever happen. But she raised quite some expectations. And, and the latest visit just showed that uh, it is an illusion to come to such terms. And Again, this does not fall on all too fruitful grounds for those who see the transatlantic relationship as a strong, sustainable pillar at the moment. I do, but uh, it's, uh, some of these things are in shambles right now. Great. Yeah. That's given us a, a wonderful tour, a uh, global tour of the impact over the last year. So I'd like to pitch another question to each of you, which is essentially look forward. Uh, what do you see as the long-term effects of this playing out over the next year, the next five years? And, and another way of putting it is if we're holding the, the five-year or the 10-year retrospective of this, how might we talk about it different than what you just laid out there? And as part of that, if there's a negative aspect, what are your policy recommendations for how we might steer around those negative potential legacies in the year ahead? So why don't we just go in the same order again? Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, again, I'm gonna focus on Brazil because that's really the, yeah. the country where we saw the, the, the biggest impact uh, in our relationship. Um, and I think you can focus on this in three levels. One is the actual issue of the revelations about the leaks and the espionage. And I think where the US and Brazil have left this is that Brazil has been expecting an apology. The United States is not really willing to give it. But that issue, I think, increasingly has been set aside by both governments. And I think they're looking forward now, uh, possibly after the Brazilian elections in October, to restarting uh, uh, the very active agenda they had until last summer, uh, in summer 2013. So I think that particular issue is being sort of slowly fading from the bilateral relationship. Um, the other thing I think, looking forward, uh, is how do we assess Brazilian efforts with relation to their own internet and the proposals that President Rousseff had made uh, to, uh, a, in reaction to the, the Snowden uh, revelations uh, of how to uh, 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 alter Brazil's connect, you know, relationship to the global internet. And I think there there's an argument to be made that actually what she was doing is just reframing some existing programs uh, uh, that the Brazilians had already been pursuing. The Brazilians have always had a national content policy. 
on a wide range of technology issues, including things like servers. Uh, Brazil had already had a very active policy since at least 2004, by some accounts, to build up domestic bandwidth, uh, production bandwidth. And Brazil has the second highest number of internet exchange points in the world after the United States. Um, Brazil has an extremely active and uh, internet savvy population, second largest number of Facebook users in the world, I believe. Um, and Brazil had already been building a number of new cables and interconnections, uh, undersea cables, to other parts of the world, including something called the BRICS cable, um, even before these revelations that happened. So I think what you saw uh, to a certain extent was Brazil reframing some of the things it was already doing uh, that were designed to increase its national capacity in this area as a reaction, sort of cleverly repurposing existing policies to show the public that they were reacting to these revelations. Uh, but the third area where we've seen very interesting movement is on the whole issue of global internet governance, which has become linked to this issue, I think, in the, uh, the global debate. Um, and there, I think, uh, we've seen Brazil move quite a bit. Um, uh, originally, traditionally, Brazil has been closer to Russia, India, China on the sort of um, national sovereignty of the internet versus multi-stakeholder model approach to global internet governance. Um, and what we saw with the Net Mundial Conference in, in Rio is Brazil really come out uh, four square four uh, multi-stakeholder approach to global internet governance. But that said, one in which uh, the institutions associated with that multi-stakeholder approach are decentered from the United States or become more internationalized, and also one in which governments have a more of a co-equal status with the other stakeholders uh, in this approach, which actually is a, a debate that goes on in, among fo uh, people who, who, who's, who, who participate in this about what exactly role should governments play in addition to civil society and the private sector, which actually operates most of the internet. Um, so Brazil's shifting its position uh, I think is a sort of hopeful sign in the long term. Um, and in fact, I think one of the things that we're seeing uh, based on its domestic process, which has just led to the adoption of uh, what the, the Marco Civil, which is being called the Internet Bill of Rights in, in Brazil, is something that's actually much closer to U.S. civil society and private sector positions on global internet governance rather than U.S. government positions. Uh, so in a sense, I think you're starting to see Brazil, you know, resort to a traditional strategy, which is seize the moral high ground and then uh, criticize uh, uh, other actors in the system from that position. So that's what I see going forward. Um, I'd say there are, there, there are a few different effects, depending on kind of which perspective you're looking at, uh, at it from. On the impact on the US-India relationship over the fi next five years or so, I'd say it, ref it will reflect the general trajectory of the relationship. If the, if the cooperative elements in the relationship, in the official US-India relationship are being emphasized, you will hear very little about this. If differences are at the forefront broadly and not just on this, you will hear this being brought up again and again, it will have an impact on trust. There's a new Indian government in place, uh, a number of working relationships will be ha have to be established as will trust, but on the specific issue of the revelations themselves, now Prime Minister Modi, uh, when he was still a candidate, just, uh, in fact, just a week or so before uh, the results were declared, was specifically asked about the revelations and if he would have reacted differently, if he would have come out more strongly and spoken out against, and he was asked repeatedly, he declined to answer, uh, put aside the question saying, I don't have enough information. Uh, he's, chose, he's made clear that uh, counterterrorism policy will be a main priority for his government, uh, partly by naming, this has been reflected in his naming of uh, Ajit Doval, who is, used to be the head of India's intelligence bureau, as his national security advisor. Uh, Mr. Daval has been on record as saying he actually thinks Indians, India's anti-terror laws are, are not tough enough. Uh, so in that sense, you're not likely to see a major move away from the official side, both on the issue itself, but on the impact on US-India relations, unless there is a broader kind of breakdown or a more emphasis on neg the negative side of the relationship. I would say, just as Harold did, uh, that on the kind of question of global governance, internet governance, the debate both within government in India, but also outside it, it is something some have linked to this question and will likely to continue to link. Uh, but on the other hand, you've had others taking them on, people who are more on the same page uh, as the US, especially uh, speaking from the private sector perspective, who've actually said that these two issues should be delinked, that the Snowden revelations, uh, the NSA uh, surveillance issues should be delinked uh, from the question of global internet governance because India has much more at stake 
uh, on, on the latter question. Uh, so we will see that play out, uh, continue to play out. Um, on the implications for the US private sector, uh, a number of uh, IT and communications uh, companies have interest there, want to invest more. But yet again, just like uh, Harold mentioned on the Brazilian side, most of the things like local sourcing or the concerns about uh, US companies, or not just US companies, including Chinese companies, foreign companies in general, being involved in these sectors predated any of these revelations. If anything, they just reinforced uh, or re in fact used to justify uh, the, the existing policies and, and a, a desire not to move away from them. Finally, I would just say that how this plays out will depend on two things, and we'll see, and, and some of this uh, we'll see play out. One is the, the, how the debate within India on Indian laws about privacy, about the balance between security and, and civil liberties plays out. And there is a debate that's domestic uh, that is playing out uh, right now, and, and it'll depend on that. And a, se a second thing we'll, we'll, it'll depend on is the incidence of terrorist attacks in India. If there is a, a major attack or a series of attacks, uh, you will see, uh, in fact, perhaps segments of the Indian population calling for uh, less uh, civil uh, emphasis on civil liberties or, uh, and, and more on the security side. Uh, in fact, even saying that the, the Indian uh, security establishment should be more like that uh, of the US. Asia. Oh, sure. Um, well, I want you to think about three things, uh, the US, China, and internet governance. I think that would be a good way to look at this. What was the book I saw on the way out? It was Ours to Lead or something, or Still Ours to Lead? Boy, that's delusional. Um, it's not still ours to lead, right? The, we inherited leadership, uh, and starting in about 2000, um, it's been a bumpy downhill road. So a lot will depend on how the US reinvents its policies, reinvents its strategies. Fortunately, we have the, the author of it on the next panel to respond. So. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I just, we are not, we are not, uh, and the global reaction, in some ways Snowden prompted a global reaction to Iraq and to drone strikes and to Guantanamo, which is still open. Uh, the whole thing, to the indignities people suffer when they come into the border. Uh, the U.S. request for data. So we need to come up with a new game to regain influence. And there's a, some signs that we're doing that, but I think Snowden in some ways focused uh, a larger discontent. And you hear this, well, the U.S. has lost its uh, moral leadership, uh, the statement you hear from some people. So we're going to need to come up with some uh, new ideas here. Uh, I want to come back to that. Um, the Chinese are, I think, in a difficult situation. They domestically have, uh, and I want to focus on them because they are um, the pivot point for Asia. They um, have a tremendous, uh, tremendously difficult domestic political situation, and it's not going to get better. So immense internal strains that limit in some way their abilities to move on other issues, particularly things like cybersecurity. But for the, when you talk to the Chinese, they're always talking about zero-sum games. And what that means is for China to gain, the US must lose. And until they can redefine their relationship with us in some way, um, that's going to point to more tensions. I think when you ask them, you know, what's up with uh, this little rock that you're fighting over with Japan? Well, that's a US plot. Uh, they, I just heard from People's Congress members last week that China's historic claims, all its maritime claims were historically based in fact. And I thought, well, that was really interesting because the British have a really good historical claim to North America. And, um, you know, uh, we, we will need, I, the path we're on with, with China is not a positive one and we'll need to think of some way to change that. And the US is doing an okay job in managing that, but um, as part of this larger sort of reinvention Finally, on internet governance, there's two problems, and I know the other panel will talk about this uh, later, but um, governments are going to extend sovereign control, and that's just how it's going to be. When the design for the internet was created for internet governance, we thought it was going to be a toy, right? We thought it was going to be like a big online eBay, and there'd be a few million, hundred million users. It wasn't going to be a big deal. We did not expect it to become the central infrastructure for global commerce and global society. 
and the governance structure that was created by the Clinton administration in the late 90s is inadequate. Many countries have come to this conclusion, and they're looking for ways to extend their sovereign control. The most recent being, of course, the European Court of Justice, and their um, amazing decision that uh, people had the right to be forgotten, which I, from an American perspective, I don't know what Cam will say about this, that struck me, I would have called it just censorship, it's a little easier to spell, but um, we're going to see things like that, encroachments on this uh, notion we had of a global network, and how we deal with that will be very important for determining the effect of Snowden. The existing multi-stakeholder argument is inadequate, and I think there's a general recognition of that, although it's not usually said in public. That's not to say abandon multi-stakeholder, but it is to say it needs to evolve, right? And so maybe we'll hear more about that on the second panel. So I think those are the issues by which we'll judge the effect of Snowden. I didn't mention Russia, I don't know. I, I, tend, to, I tend to agree with the president about Russia and their relative status, but I think the relation with China will be um, the crucial foreign policy problem for the US in the next, next few years. Snowden, has only affected that in its affected, um, focused attention to the need for the US to come up with a, a, a post-war on terror foreign policy. Thank you, I agree with uh, most of the points you've made, Jim. On the right to be forgotten, just, uh, just a footnote on that, on that very um, latest decision of the European Court of Justice, a remarkable one. I dare to say that uh, it would not have been formulated the way it had been, has been formulated uh, without last year's um, developments we have seen so far. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that will be discussed rather thoroughly, I think, for the next month to come. Uh, on a short-term perspective, it, if the Germans had to make a decision on Snowden, they would probably grant him sainthood immediately, probably quicker than John Paul II, and offer him a place <laughs> in the plane um, with the German team to Brazil. <laughs> the German soccer team, but uh, that certainly doesn't resolve any of the issues. You may have followed also the discussion we have had about uh, giving him a chance to appear before the Bundestag's investigation committee uh, to, to, to speak, uh, to talk there. I don't think that this is going to happen because the uh, government's position has been rather clear on that, but that's uh, still in flux that very, that, that, that very debate. On the next years to come, I think that we will still see many, many attempts uh, from the European side to at least try how far they can go with a development I would call data secessionism. So that's maybe a different term for the balkanization or the dream about the balkanization of the internet. So there's lots of emphasis at the moment behind the idea of a European cloud, of, of, forming, of forming even a Schengen routing, um, as you know, the Schengen the Schengen uh, area in Europe, which uh, consists of the countries that don't have any border controls any longer. Most interestingly, this is uh, the UK is not part of it. By the way, it's also quite uh, remarkable to see how well off uh, the UK is in the whole debate in Europe, because uh, their, their services, their intel services, had, uh, have been actually more successful on many topics than the NSA. And, 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 and it's quite a bit more than that, and they're not part of a fierce debate or of the fierce debate we are facing right now in, in Europe. So that's, uh, that's it's quite, quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, development as well. After, I think after a while, there will be the moment when we've, we'll have a discussion whether the opportunity costs of any of these secessionist movements are worthwhile doing such things. <laughs> And, and, and whether security is actually the result, or more security will be the result. I personally doubt it. I think it, uh, it, it will become rather, probably more insecure if we, if we don't find thoroughly thorough thought through steps uh, in, uh, internet, in, in, in global internet governance. Having said that, I don't see at the moment uh, quite coherent approach by the European Union, for instance, of how to, of how to form or phrase a strategy when it comes to the next uh, ITU um, uh, meeting we will have in fall right now. The European Union is not visible. Of course, there is a transition period right now. We are after the elections. There will be an outgoing and an incoming 
uh, incoming commission, a commission which obviously consists of uh, highly modernist people, uh, as it looks like right now. So the question will be, will there be a change? Uh, will there be a change of policy? Probably not too much in this respect as well. Germany is uh, emotionally leading this debate right now. This is my impression I have. On the other hand, there are a couple of paradoxes that you're facing as well. Our intelligence service right now has just asked for, and it falls on fruitful grounds, as it looks like it has asked for um, uh, real-time access to social media. Surprise, surprise. It's, uh, so that will be a debate we will have for the next months to come. And so that's what I expect for the next one, two, probably three years. It won't go away too quickly. And, and it will take quite some time, in my opinion, until a government or the, the European governments are capable of reshaping the policy towards a more, a more internationalist approach and not only a European solution or a Brazilian European solution, however you may call it, in, uh, in, in that very respect. On the private sector, it is also rather probably not astonishing, but it, it's, it's, it is quite stunning how easily the private sector is being put into one basket with the American government mm -hmm. or the intelligence service. So Google is as evil for many Germans or for other Europeans as the NSA is for them. And, and, and of course you see at the, at, at the same time that let's say some of the private sector companies could do a, and I put it very mildly, a better job when it comes to their PR uh, strategy in Europe. Um, they, let's be a bit more clear. I think Google's strategy at the moment is rather disastrous. So um, whatever they do, it, it just doesn't play out. And, and, and it doesn't play out really well. So there is uh, lots of, 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 of room to, there's, there's actually lots of room to maneuver, but the way they maneuver is, is unfortunately quite poor at the moment. So. It is, that's, so that's one thing we face, and one thing where, in my opinion, the private sector from over here has to do more than just to say, well, let's somehow regionalize. At the very moment, it has worked out what Microsoft has done, that they say, well, let's try to, to set up some regional data centers. But it's a matter of time until the interrelation of a regional data center to the American mother company and the opportunity to get data also from regional data centers in the US, if you need them over here, will, will pop up. And uh, so I don't think that's taking too long. One interesting development we see right now also with our company is that many, many, that many, many American tech companies are thinking about even moving headquarters now to Europe <laughs> as, as a hub for a wider international outreach and to somehow get rid of this suspicion being an American company that tries to leave a footprint maybe on the African continent, in the Middle East, or even in Asia. So we've had a couple of requests, or many requests right now, actually to help also with their uh, potential move to Europe, which I think is a quite, quite interesting development to look, to look at at the very moment as well. So I'd love to be a bit more, uh, a bit more gloomy and, 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 and positive, but, uh, but it's quite a mess we are in. And, and, and from a political point of view, I think we have to overcome this kind of mutual finger-pointing uh, procedure we're in right now and, 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 and to finally get to a discussion which clearly points to the, dis to the differences we have, but on the other hand also to, to find a way back to some mutual trust. Great. Well, let's turn to a discussion in this room. Uh, please raise your hand, and um, when I call on you, wait for the mic to come to you and introduce yourself. And so, if, uh, and if you have a question directed either at the panel as a whole or an individual, let us know that. So, please, anyone who has a, a question, right there in the back. Yeah. Leandra Bernstein, Rio Novosti. Uh, this is a question on what was brought up with. Uh, the United States losing its moral position in the international community. And that has, it seems as though that has been a long-term trend. And there's a lot of discussion now about uh, regionalism. Europe, uh, after the elections, appears to be moving more in a nationalistic direction, for better, for worse, I, I couldn't say. 
uh, do you think there's any potential for the United States to redefine our international security interests in a more narrow way than we have in the past decades? And if that were possible, uh, what, do you, what kind of impact do you think that would have, positive and negative? Let me just make a footnote here, which is that if there's this thing called Foreign Relations of the United States, which the State Department puts out, and if you look at the one for 1955, there's a report of a cabinet meeting where President Eisenhower says, I don't understand why all these countries don't like us. So this has been going on for a long time. I would agree that only the US has the capability to lead. It has the global presence, it has the resources, and it has the intellectual framework, which I, I think was part of the larger discussion. But to, to, to do, to act, it, having the resources and actually leading are different, and this is where I think you would need to do some rethinking. The Russian-Chinese alternative, which particularly comes up for internet governance, I don't think it has any legs. Their code of conduct, it's good for, it's, 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 it's just not going to win popular support. So I think it's possible. For, I don't see an alternative to US leadership, but that doesn't mean we will necessarily lead. Anyone else on the panel want to in? I do certainly see uh, the possibility that there, there, is, there will be an improvement, but, um, mm. but it, needs, it needs certain levels of, 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 of uh, rebuilding trust, specifically with Europe. First of all, to be aware from an American perspective, I think that uh, you cannot read Europe as Europe if, you're not, if you don't understand every single member state over there. And it's certainly not enough that this is a rather simplistic point I'm making right now over here, to leave the impression you fly in for some anniversary and you fly out again. And, and you don't keep up a certain, a certain continuous contact on, on these iffy issues we have touched upon right now. I've, I've, I've said before that there's the impression that at the moment we have one of the most detached relationships from the White House to other heads of state. And, and, and that's one of the things where there's always an opportunity to work on. Of course, uh, at the same time, European leaders have to try to, to not, to, not to react as blatantly as they, usually, as, as they momentarily do, as bluntly as they momentarily do, but also to see certain certain shades of gray in between and that all these things are not as easy as they are. But there is, of course, there is a tendency of populism. And, and unfortunately, as I've said before, anti-Americanism right now falls on fruitful grounds. It's, it's, it's unfortunately as, as, as simple as that. A second thing where I have the impression that we could work on and which would also, which would also be a a way where the Europeans should not only look at the US and say, well, they don't care about us any longer, they, 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 they have isolationist tendencies, they now have their own energy policy, they leave us alone, So, which is all not true as such. It's, uh, specifically now in the light of the Ukraine crisis, we see more American troops moving back to Europe and other things, but the communication actually is failing right now when it comes to that. And I'd like to see Europe stepping forward in this regard and making first steps and first proposals of how to get together, of how to find functioning ways, how the intelligence services could work together more properly as they do right now, and also of how to, of how to another development, which will probably be the next transatlantic, the next transatlantic discussion we will face, and that's a certain shift that goes along with the shift of information also from the public sector to the private sector. So the discussion we have had last year was mainly a discussion, almost a traditional ancient discussion, about the information the public sector holds. And also there we have seen quite some hypocrisy. It's uh, by the private sector. So they say, oh, the Googles and others, NSA is treating us so badly. If we look, uh, if we look at it honestly, probably the NSA wouldn't function the way it functions without a strong Google, Facebook, Amazon, and, 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 and other media and data and big data background as such. So if we come now into a, into, in, into a development which I would call from government to Googlement, so that uh, the private sector takes over more and more 
more and more positions and traditional ways to handle things from the public sector, we will probably have another cry of outrage after a while, specifically probably coming from Europe, where the people say, well, this, has, this is a thing the government has to handle. But there are no attempts right now to strengthen the position of the government in this very regard. So that's a debate I see at least on the horizon and, and, and where we could actually try to foster a transatlantic initiative or an international, multinational initiative to, um, to, to, to confront the perils and the challenges connected to that. Right there. Hi, my name is Caroline Dutra. I'm from Brazil. And my question goes to Mr. Harold Trincunas. Um, Snowden is in Russia and his visa is ending in August. He's asking for asylum in Brazil. Uh, what do you think will happen if Brazil concedes this, uh, this asylum to Mr. Snowden? What will be the results and the um, reaction of the United States government to this possibility? Great. Um, uh, I think, well, it would be predictably negative, but I think the prospects for Brazil actually taking that step are pretty unlikely. I think the Brazilian government has actually been signaling that they would like to get past the Snowden issue. Um, and I think uh, um, the, it was even President Rousseff has, uh, and government officials have said they haven't really received an official asylum application uh, uh, in this case. And I expect that they, they would prefer it, that it remain that way. Uh, so I think at this point in time, the, the, the Brazilian government is not particularly interested in this becoming an issue for them. Um, and uh, so I think they're gonna try to uh, set that aside in the interest of relaunching uh, the, the relationship uh, later on this fall. Uh, and of course, they're extremely busy right now with a set of other international issues with the World Cup coming up. So I'm sure they would not like this distraction uh, at this moment. If it did happen, if, could we arrange a stopover in JFK? Do you think that would be? <laughs> I mean, we could guarantee a warm welcome. Weather-wise. Me, can I pose a different one? Does his <clears throat> location somewhere, does the, I mean, the, we, we now have a, a, a status quo that um, maybe it holds forever or it changes? Does the change in location have an impact I mean, essentially, Harold, you answered it as saying um, the change in location isn't going to happen in Brazil. But that's different from saying, does it have an impact, a long-term impact, in the relationships in the different regions that you've been speaking on? Another way to put it is, where, if, if Mr. Snowden ends up somewhere else, how does that play out? I guess what I've been wondering, and this is Other a than JFK, question. which kind of resolves it. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. but. Is Snowden on the same trajectory, albeit a longer one, than uh, Julian Assange was on, right? And so you've got the sort of efforts to continually release something to get attention that kind of mirror what happened with WikiLeaks. So I wonder five years from now, whether he's in Brazil or in Russia or, you know, whatever, I don't know, North Korea, wherever he goes, um, will, will anyone really care, right? And a lot of that will depend, I think, on how the U.S. reacts and how the U.S. moves forward. But I do wonder if he isn't on the same trajectory as Assange. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Peter, I think it, it, it really is more of how countries would use that instrumentally to position themselves in their relationships with the United States. And clearly Brazil's, what I was trying to get at was obviously Brazil's not interested in positioning itself in this kind of negative or hostile relationship. It's trying to get past that with the United States. But there are countries in South America that have discussed this in the past, you know, uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, uh, uh, Nicaragua. And, would there be a case, uh, an instance, in which they would see it to their advantage to have a distraction of some sort uh, by accepting this asylum application uh, to overcome some sort of domestic or, or regional concern? Um, uh, the one thing I would say is that that, set of, that group of countries uh, is not quite as well positioned internationally, it's not as strong economically or politically or as stable as they were when this issue first came to light. So I think even they have to think a little bit carefully about whether they really want to assume the risks of doing this at a time where they're not quite as strong internationally or domestically uh, in their ability to meet the, the mm. 
the requirements of hosting. And, uh, and I think that's the same thing in India. The only two places that he could move or want to move that would make a, dis you know, a difference would be if he actually eventually came back here and what the US reaction, et cetera, would be. And if he yet again made it clear that he was interested in, in seeking asylum in India, which did happen, and at that point, mo it was mostly a discussion about positioning to say, no, the US uh, is a partner and will not do this. But the other thing is setting a really bad precedent uh, at, to the to internal uh, officials at home. Uh, and so you're not going to see, other than that, other countries, I don't think you will see much of a discussion uh, in terms of change location. Sure. Um, in the back there in the striped tie, yeah. Hi, I'm Joe Marks from Politico. Uh, most of what we talked about so far today has been um, sort of large policy shaping nations. I'm wondering if you can talk about what effect the Snowden leaks will have on smaller developing nations that are just coming online or coming on online in force now either directly or through the internet governance debates that it's sparked or helps to spark? One of the things I had to do at the end of my government career was negotiate with a range of countries on what we used to call lawful access to communications. I never found a country that didn't engage in it. So I think one of the things you'll see, and I just had a long talk with a uh, African uh, government official from their Ministry of Communications, all countries do this, and so I think what they're looking back at is where's the role of the U.S.? What is the feeling about U.S. leadership? Or what does the, is there a split, and I forget who said this, is U.S. official statements and U.S. behavior, and that divergence, I think, is what shapes a lot of their attitudes towards uh, Internet governance. That said, there really isn't a compelling al alternative yet. Um, the Russians might be trying to come up with a compelling alternative, but the choices for, for smaller countries are still somewhat limited. They're going to have surveillance. Um, they would like a bigger role in internet governance. Uh, they're waiting to see how the US um, moves out in, on these issues. And I, I would just add that, I mean, uh, there's a couple things to keep in mind, is that in a sense, a lot of the critical internet resources that allow you to affect the, 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 how the, the, the regime is operated are in the hands of the private sector and largely concentrated in developed countries. And so the developing countries, as they come online, really have to keep that in mind as well. It's not a, I mean, there's a government to government discussion uh, that you just pointed to, but also that, that private sector role. And, and the other thing is, to the extent that these developing countries have um, national uh, telecommunication ministries or corporations that provide the service, they're gonna to tend to towards the side of the debate that favors state sovereignty over the internet. Whereas some of the countries we've discussed uh, you know, here, I mean, you know, if you look, think about India or Brazil, they have very important private sector control of these kinds of resources and, and technologies, and uh, that creates a debate that's much closer to the kind of debate our private sector and civil society has uh, about these issues. So I'd, I'd really think about where these developing countries fall in, in that spectrum of, of who provides, in a sense, the internet domestically. Let's get one last question. Uh, right there in the front of the blue. Hi. Oh, wait, wait for the mic. Oh, Thank you. Hi, my name's Rachel. I'm a student at Yale University studying national security. And my question is to all of you, really. Multiple of you mentioned that the US has lost the moral high ground, at least in the view of some people. And I'd like to know, how do each of your respective regions think that the US can regain that moral high ground? In other words, since most of you admitted espionage is not going to stop, and that's clear to all of us, how do the countries in your regions think that the US can engage in moral espionage? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll... I'll we'll lead just off. go down the road again, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that the key thing to keep in mind about Brazil and its particular outrage over uh, the Stone Revelations is Brazil has traditionally, historically, been very careful to defend its sovereignty. So I'm not sure there's, the Brazilians would really, they'd be very uh, dubious about the concept of moral espionage, although I think many people in their government admit that you know, they conduct espionage and this is fairly normal. Um, but uh, they would distinguish that from, from sort of moral behavior, at least in the terms of international law and uh, defense of sovereignty. Uh, um, so, so, uh, but 
the other thing I would say is that the, in terms of the domestic politics of this in Brazil, because of the history of the military dictatorship and the role of espionage played in the, uh, uh, as used by the military, there's an additional level of domestic political sensitivities on espionage issues that makes it an issue that Brazilian governments would have to handle carefully. So they, they certainly wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't officially admit or have a, you know, th to take a, a, a statement of making claims such as moral espionage is an interesting phrase. Um, I'm not sure in India there would be a sense that the U.S. could either, uh, there's not, I don't think there's much of a discussion about this in the first place, but I think there's not, uh, amongst those there is, uh, there's a question of whether the U.S. can regain the high moral ground, or frankly, if it should. Uh, I think the, what you will find is people stating uh, that there needs to be a closing in the gap uh, between what the U.S. says and what it does. And I do think this is also related to the earlier question about you know, decline and where the, there was more discussion about this question of US decline broadly uh, rather than this question of moral high ground itself. And on that, you know, just, just to kind of add to, to what was said on the question of decline, you saw that discussion about the US is declining a few years ago. Uh, I'd say one of the things that helped change that, at least in India, was the energy revolution. And you've now heard more talk about, well, the US might not, is not declining that much. Why is it behaving like it's declining? Uh, but that doesn't mean there's an, there's an interest in India in the US being more involved. Like every other country, it wants India, uh, the US to be involved in its, its areas of interest, including Asia. Uh, but there is also kind of a, a, a sense of they want more engagement, not necessarily intervention. So there is a distinction between, between that. And so there's much more focused on the US regaining things in that sense, in terms of global involvement, and not so much on the moral high ground. I love the term moral espionage. Uh, <laughs> can I ask whether I'm allowed to copy that? I have some experience with copying things. So it's, uh, um, I, do, I, do, I, do, I don't think that the European that the European expectation <laughs> goes anywhere close to, um, to some moral leadership of the US. It's, uh, the enthusiasm regarding that is rather limited, to put it mildly. I think the expectation goes more into a direction that, that the US should actually try to understand a bit more the discrepancy we face in the interrelation of privacy and security in Europe and over here. So if there's, a, if, if, if there's some outreach just to, to find understanding on both sides that a German, a Frenchman, or an Italian reacts entirely differently to the question of privacy than over here, instead of con continuously stretching the term shared values, uh, shared, shared approaches, all the other things. We have them, of course, but there we are distinct, really distinct. And so that's, that's, I think that would be a moral perspective which would be appreciated in Europe, that to say it's not about regaining high grounds, it's actually try to come on a level playing field at the eyesight. And, and I think there is an opportunity to do that. At the same time, as I've said before, the Europeans have to be extremely cautious not to immediately counter-react and say, hey, there they are again, and try to lecture us on things uh, we just don't want to hear from the other side of the Atlantic. But uh, more high grounds, I don't think, is, is the solution we would like to reach. Mm. So um, I do think rumors of our demise have been overstated. And uh, I, I'm, I think I'm one of the people, I don't know what the other panelists think, who question the term uh, BRICS. Uh, so I think that the relative positions of these countries remains largely the same, and the US remains, if nothing else, primus inter pares, right? Um, we are seeing, and I'm sorry, I, you know, I, can't, I can't resist the term multipolar. We are seeing the outlines of a sort of new multipolar world emerge, and Crimea and Snowden and the, the China debate, the indictments, give us some, the ECG, ICJ, give us some idea of what this multipolar world will look like. It's not going to be the 1930s or the 19th century. And in that then, the question is, how does the US continue to shape the world, shape international events in ways that um, it thinks are beneficial? And 
I, I think that someone said the word engagement, and I think that's really the key word. It's not going to be a grand crusade again, right? It's not going to be the Cold War. I, I wrote down Cold War light, but I, I'm not going to say it. Um, it's not going to be a grand crusade. It's not going to be World War II. We're not going to re, you know, invade uh, France. Um, but uh, it will be our leadership in specific issues, and to some extent, our example on these issues. And that's where the discrepancy revealed by Snowden between what we said. And again, from a legal perspective, you know, the US had a strong legal justification for its actions. And I think, unfortunately, many other people, many other countries saw that as hair splitting. Uh, you know, yes, what we did was legal under both international law and domestic law, and the rest of the world's reaction is largely, so what, right? So how do we, how do we regain, through engagement, a position where we can shape the agenda in a way that will reinvigorate uh, an approach towards democracy and rule of law. And that's sort of up in the air. We're, we're making efforts, but we, we're at a transitional moment in, in foreign policy. And it's not um, easy to say what it'll, it will not be the Cold War, it won't be the war on terror. What will it be? That's, I think, what this administration and its successors uh, will need to define. Well, I want to thank the panelists for joining us. They've taken us on a, a uh, I won't say a great global tour, in some ways kind of a mixed news global tour, uh, but I appreciate you joining us. Please um, join me in a round of applause for them.